Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Welcome to the Circle Church this morning. And uh, so thankful that you're here, that you chose this place um, as your place of gathering for worship this morning. We're worshiping Jesus and Jesus alone. And, um, and then also, happy Father's Day uh, to all you great dads out there. Um, I'm wearing this hat this morning, and uh, it's more than a hat to me. It's special. Um, my papa, who was my father figure um, in life, passed away, and um, one of the things that he left for me is this hat, and uh, this is something that he wore all of his life, just about every day, and uh, so I don't, that's the memory I have. Um, I have other memories, and I don't know what memory you have this morning of your father um, here on earth. Um, maybe you struggle with that. Maybe you've come here this morning and it's this difficult for you. Maybe you didn't have um, uh, a father on this earth um, to lead, uh, lead you an example, or maybe that's a struggle for you. Maybe it's a struggle for you this morning because um, you've lost your father. And so this day may be challenging for you and difficult. Um, and I would say this, that um, someone on this earth may let you down, um, but our Father in heaven doesn't. He's faithful, he's good, and he can be trusted, and he's the one that we worship this morning. Amen? And so let's, uh, let's worship in spirit and in truth, and uh, let's pray uh, before the Lord. Father, we love you. God, we thank you so much for all that you've done. We thank you for your goodness towards us. Uh, Jesus, we thank you for, um, for just being good um, in all seasons of life. And we know that there are many people here today that are experiencing um, good, but there are also may, may be some bad in life. And so I, I pray that in whatever season that you would speak, that your spirit would draw men to, unto yourself, God. And, and Jesus, this morning, that your love would be felt. And God, we thank you for fathers, and we thank you ultimately for... Um, for the example that you've left, that, that us as men can follow. Um, Jesus, we ask that in this place this morning that you would move in power and might, and, and Father, that you would do a work in lives. And if there is one that's lost this morning, we pray that they would be saved, they'd be found. If there's discouragements, that they would be encouraged by your word, that your spirit would move. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for this day and this time that we have together. In this name I pray and all God's people said together. Amen. Amen. Let's work.
your hands together to celebrate. Jesus, you're the only reason that I'm even breathing. I am wide awake. You move, your freedom is consuming. I feel it rushing through me. I'll never be the same. Oh, my heart beats only for your glory. My hands reach up for you to hold me. My soul sings.
going to sing that again. Prodigals, come home. Prodigals, come home. The helpless find hope. The love is on the moon when the father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide. The dead come to life. The love is on the moon when the father's in the room. Father's house to see the prodigals come home. The cynical find faith. That's why we're here.
Turn with me to 1 Peter today. 1 Peter chapter 3. While you turn there, I just want to mo- take a moment and welcome our guests. We have a lot of guests today. Maybe you came to see Adam be baptized. Maybe you came for different reasons. For whatever reason you're here, we are just glad that you are. And we really hope that you feel welcome and comfortable because this is, as we said a moment ago, a place where we believe the Spirit of God is residing and where He is moving. And wherever His Spirit is, there is freedom. So we hope you feel that freedom, that you don't feel judgment and condemnation, but instead today you hear a message about a God who is merciful and gracious and quick to forgive. Slow to anger, but very, very quick to forgiveness. And if you're joining us online today, we want to welcome you as well. Thank you for tuning in and for listening to the Word of God through this medium. We just hope you too feel encouraged, and maybe at a future date that you'll come and join us here at the Circle Church. Perhaps you're staying at home because of corona. Maybe you or a family member are at risk. We understand that. and We are praying for you, for your health, and for God's blessing in your life. 1 Peter chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 1 through 7, and then we'll see what God has to say to his church today. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word, by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not merely be external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you have become her children, if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. This is God's word to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. Father, your word is living. Your word is active. Your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces as far as the division of both soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. And it's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Father, we see things as they are on the outside, but you see things as they truly are inside of us. You see our hopes, you see our fears. Father, you see our dreams, you see the things that we dread, the things that are holding us back, the things that inspire us. I pray that today as we see your word, that it would see us and that we would see ourselves the way you see us. Father, that we would claim every good gift that you have for us, that we would be encouraged and built up through this living word, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin today, I feel the need to qualify this. I did not pick this passage for Father's Day. Uh, If you've been joining us for any period of time here in the last last few months, you'll know that coming out of our isolation from coronavirus, I felt led of the Lord to preach out of 1 Peter because it is a message written to exiles. It's a message written to people who are living in, as aliens in this world. And I felt like that was a message that was very, very relevant for us. But how could I have known that this would be the text, this would be the passage that I would speak on on Father's Day? And as we read these words, we see that we have some things that need some definition and some clarity. But before we get to that, I just want to bring you up to speed on where we've been and where we're going in this message series on First Peter. You see, First Peter is a letter to a people that is living in exile. It's written to the churches of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, regions such as Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And these individuals who were Christians were living in a land that was not their own. However, while in the Old Testament, exile was always the result of disobedience, God would send his people into exile because they disobeyed his word. First Peter is unique in this way. These individuals were exiled not because of their disobedience to God, but they were exiles because of their obedience to God. We saw this in chapter 1, verse 2, 
where Peter writes to those whom he calls God's chosen. And he says that they are chosen for two things. First, to obey Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. And we understand here that obedience refers to our initial acceptance of the gospel. Because in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, we're told that the churches of Asia Minor had, in obedience to the truth, purified their souls for a sincere love of the brethren. In 1 Peter, obedience refers to that initial act of conversion. It has to do with being translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God's dear son. But here's the thing. The moment that we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the moment we're translated from one house into another house, what does that make us in this world? It makes us aliens and strangers and exiles because this is not our home anymore. Our home is in Christ, and Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. So the image painted in 1 Peter is of a new Israel that is wandering through a new wilderness, this world waiting to be called home to their true home. We are exiles, not in spite of our calling church, but we are exiles in this world precisely because of it. As a result of our obedience, something else comes. And if you have your message notes, you can write these down. The first one is obedience, but here's the second one. Obedience brings with it opposition. And we see this increasingly in our day. If you attempt to obey Jesus Christ and follow his teachings, you will experience opposition. It will start at home. We're going to see that here in a moment. But it will continue from there to every different segment of society. We live in a world that is increasingly hostile to God. However, it was the same way in the first century under the Roman Empire and the Roman government. And it's just a truth. When you follow Jesus, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So our life of obedience makes us aliens. And because of that obedience, we experience opposition. But here is the message of hope that 1 Peter offers us. With this opposition comes opportunity. For he says in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, that if we keep our behavior excellent among the Gentiles, which is just another word for the nations, all the nations of the earth as we live in this world, if we keep our behavior excellent, we have the hope that the very people who today deny Jesus Christ will on the day that he returns glorify God. Our excellent behavior in a world that opposes us is a hope for this world. And so what Peter does in 1 Peter is he explains to us how exactly it is that we are to live in the face of this kind of opposition. Now, opposition takes a lot of different forms, but here's the irony that we find in 1 Peter. Opposition is most keenly felt from the members of one's own household. And this should not surprise us, because the Apostle Peter was, after all, a follower of Jesus Christ. He walked with Jesus throughout his earthly ministry and heard him say things like this, a man's enemies, I'm quoting Matthew 10, 36, a man's enemies will be the members of his household. As one turns to Christ and pledges his loyalty and allegiance to a new family, opposition will come from one's family here on earth who are unbelievers. Peter would have been aware of this, and so in explaining to the churches of Asia Minor how it is they should live in a world that was hostile to the gospel, he utilizes something called a household code. And you may never have heard of this before, but a household code was just a form that was common in the ancient world that explained one's various duties to the members within one's household. We find household codes in secular literature, from the first century, but we also find it in the Bible. Ephesians has a household code. Colossians has a household code. But the household code here in Peter is unique in two ways. First of all, it is outward in its orientation. And we saw this a couple of weeks ago. First Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Peter begins his household code, not with instructions about how to live with the members of one's household, but with our obligations to all human beings, including to the emperor and the governors of the various provinces of the Roman Empire. 
By doing that, what Peter does is he frames our household responsibilities. You need to get this. He frames our household responsibilities within our broader civic obligation to submit ourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Why does he do this? Because he is urging his readers to treat the members of their household the same way that they would treat anyone else within society. And he does this to imply that there are members in their households who are non-believers. They have not yet come to faith in Jesus Christ. But just because they're not believers does not mean that we as Christians do not owe them deference, respect, and honor. And so Peter begins by laying out this principle that even if you're dealing with people in the world who do not honor God, you still owe them honor, even if they are members of your own household. This is the first way in which Peter's code differs from the others. It is outward in orientation, but it's different in the second way, and that is that it focuses on the most oppressed members of the family. And this is very important for us to understand because as we read these words just a moment ago, I would say that maybe some of them rubbed some of us the wrong way. They felt kind of strange, kind of foreign, especially in an age so conditioned by feminism. But what we need to understand is that Peter is speaking in his household code, not to the more powerful members of the household, as they were defined in the first century, but he's speaking to the more oppressed members. So, for example, if you read the household codes in Ephesians and Colossians, you're going to find the Apostle Paul speaking to both slaves and masters. And if you want to learn about that, listen to our sermon from last week. It's been posted this very morning. But he speaks there to slaves and masters. But when you look at the letter of 1 Peter, Peter addresses slaves, but he omits any words to masters entirely. Why does he do that? Well, because there probably were no masters in the churches to which he was writing. Because these were believers in the gospel. And if one believes in the gospel, one understands we are free. And our spiritual freedom should be expressed in the liberation of those who in our world are themselves oppressed. That's the vision that he has. And so he speaks to slaves. Because slaves are the more oppressed member of the relationship. And so when we come here to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1-7, through 7, here's what we find. Six verses addressed to wives. And only one verse that's addressed to men. Is that fair? I mean, why is it that the ladies get six verses, and why is it the husbands only get one verse? It is not because Peter hates women. He is not a misogynist. Instead, Peter understands that in the culture to which he was writing, women were the more oppressed member of the husband and wife relationship. And so they need some strong encouragement and clear direction on how it is that they are to live because their subordination might lead to depression or to oppression. And so he speaks to them to give them guidance. So having said that, we're going to look at four things today. Number one, if you have your message notes, you can write this down under the title Husbands and Wives. Let's look at the principle that Peter gives to wives in this context. The principle. We saw it in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, in the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. So notice. Peter is here not teaching the submission of women to men. Let's be very clear about this. He is not teaching, generally speaking, the submission of women to men. No, what he is teaching is the submission of wives to husbands. Women are not, in general, submitted to men. This is not the biblical teaching. But within the marriage relationship, the Bible clearly teaches and your pastor will unapologetically declare, because this is the word of God, that in the marriage relationship, the female occupies a pet place of submission. Let's look at this a little bit. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. What I want you to understand is that this idea is rooted in the creation order itself. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. 
Here the Apostle Paul is writing, and he says, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Notice what he says. Christ is the head of every man. Take a look around you, ladies. Do you see a man? Here is their head, Christ. Whether they believe or whether they do not believe. Because what does he say? Christ is the head of every man. If your husband is a believer, you can thank God that Christ is his head. If your husband is a non-believer, you can thank God. Christ is his head. Doesn't mean he believes, doesn't mean he may be a person of faith, but nonetheless, Christ is the head of every man. But notice what he goes on to say. A man is the head of a woman. Again, it doesn't say that men are the heads of women. Men over women specifically. But no, what does it say? It says that within the marriage relationship, the husband is the head in relationship to the woman. And notice number three, it says that God is the head of Christ. So here we have this statement about headship, not necessarily hierarchy, but headship. God over Christ, Christ over every man, and by the grace of God within the marriage relationship, a husband being the head of a wife. And on this basis, we find the teaching of the New Testament towards men and women. If you read Ephesians, it says, Wives, be submissive to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. This may be new, it may be novel, it may sound offensive in some way, but when you understand the Bible's teaching about submission and the Bible's teaching about sacrifice, what you will see is a beautiful way for God's very image to be expressed in the husband-wife relationship. But let's remember that Peter here is not teaching the submission of women to men, but of wives to husbands. Let's look at a second truth. Peter is not teaching submission to Christian husbands only, but to husbands in general even to those who are disobedient to the word. Look again, 1 Peter 3. He says, In the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. Now remember, for Peter, the word obedience refers to the initial moment of conversion. To obey Jesus Christ is to accept him as Lord and Savior. So what would disobedient to the word mean? it means the individual has not yet accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But why would these Christian women be married to non-Christian men? Because does it not say in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13, do not be bound together with unbelievers? Maybe you've never heard this before, but the Bible teaches that if we profess Jesus Christ, we should not be bound together in relationship to unbelievers. We build relationships. We build bridges. We are ambassadors of reconciliation. But the Bible says that within marriage, it should be between individuals who are equally yoked, bound together out of love and devotion for Christ. So how could Peter be writing to Christian women who are married then to non-Christian husbands? I'll tell you why. It's because these women had been saved out of a pagan background. When they married their husbands, their husbands weren't Christians, and they weren't Christians. But somewhere along the way, they heard the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, the message that in him there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, but we are all one in Jesus Christ. Christianity spread not amongst the mighty, but amongst the weakest, the most oppressed members of society. And women were coming to the faith in great, great numbers. But there was a problem. And that is in a pagan society, women were expected to worship their husbands' gods. Uh-oh. <laughs> Do you see how a problem has been set up here? You have women coming to faith in Jesus Christ that he is the only way to the Father. And then you have men who are worshiping various Roman deities, like maybe Jupiter, right? 
or Juno. Or maybe they're worshiping the emperor himself. Or maybe they're various household gods. And now this lady who has been saved out of paganism is only worshiping Jesus Christ. Do you see how this could pose a problem within the marriage relationship? You can also see why Christianity was viewed with suspicion. It was because of Christianity that wedges were being driven into otherwise good Roman households. This religion is a problem because it seems to be dividing families at the seams. But here's what Peter does. He does not permit these women to worship their husband's gods, but he nevertheless commands them to be submissive to their husbands. Don't worship their gods, and yet, at the same time, be submissive to your husband. Now, what has confused many a conscientious Christian woman since then is how do you do both of those at the same time? How do you submit to your husband when his loyalties are not the same as yours? It is a vexing question. It is a difficult question. And that's why he gives them six verses and men only one. Because women face a very, very difficult situation. But let me give you what I believe to be an answer. Look at Romans chapter 13. Romans 13 and verse 10. And by the way, the reason I ask you to turn to different scriptures, I don't want to give you my opinion on what things are. I want us to look at the word and see what it says. You test what I say by the word of God, especially on a matter like this. See what God has to say and draw your own conclusion. Romans 13, 10. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. What's the principle here? Love does no wrong. Love does no injury. Love does not harm. So let's take that principle and apply it to the husband-wife relationship when the wife is a believer and the husband is not. I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it out loud, but answer it in your own mind. Does it help or hurt a husband to join him in a false religion? I'm going to ask this question again. Does it help or hurt the husband to join him in a false religion? I would answer that it hurts him. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, to join someone in error, how exactly does that help that individual? Because what you're doing is you're affirming them in a wrong behavior. But at the same time, two wrongs don't make a right. And so in not joining him in that behavior, one must at the same time fulfill the duty of a wife, which Peter describes as submission, to submit to the husband. And here is what this kind of submission looks like. Though I do not join him in his loyalty to pagan gods, what I do is I nonetheless submit to him by offering to him what here Peter calls chaste and respect respectful behavior. Now, I hear that word chaste, and it makes you think of like goody two-shoes and church lady and, you know, something like that. But all chaste here means is holy, pure. And we saw it in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. You are to be holy as I am holy. Holiness is one of the key themes of 1 Peter. We are to be a holy people. And then it says reverent behavior. Now, some men, ladies, will say what that means is you need to revere me. You need to respect me. Let me ask you a question. Are we holy in relationship to our husbands or holy in relationship to God? What do you think? Are we holy in relationship to our husbands or holy in relationship to God? I would say primarily we're holy in relationship to God. So the respect and reverence that Peter speaks of here, is it respect and reverence for the husband? Because he's not always that respectable, right? Or is it respect and reverence for God? It is for the Lord. In other words, I submit to my husband, not because he deserves it, but because I owe God holiness and reverence. And the God who saved me commands me to be submissive to my husband. As I do this, here is what I can expect. 
even if any of these husbands are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. Ladies, here's a sad reality. Your husband's life often will not change on the basis of what you say. In fact, oftentimes, it can have the very opposite effect. Let's look at Proverbs for a moment. Proverbs 21. I pray that as we address these issues today, we're doing so biblically and sensitively. And yet at the same time, candidly, I mean, we can laugh a little bit, right? We can poke fun at ourselves and and the fact that it's hard to live with a woman and it's even harder to live with a man. Amen? These things are tough. Well, in Proverbs 21, verse 19, Solomon speaks to us very candidly. He says, it's better to live in a desert land than with a contentious and vexing woman. Now, I'm not going to ask for amens on this one. This is just a statement coming from Solomon. So here's the idea. Okay, dude, you got the option. You can live with a house with plenty of food, plenty of water, and all of the amenities. Or you can live in a desert with nothing to drink, nothing to eat. You are going to die. But in the desert, you have peace. In the house, you have nothing but contention. Here's my advice to you. Die in the desert. Because it is better, he says, to live in a desert land than with a contentious and vexing woman. He's not saying that women are contentious and vexing. Something that disturbs me is how men can generalize and joke about women, and in so doing, put them down. And give the idea that through things like this, it's somehow true. That all women are contentious, all women are vexing, and a man's place is to keep them in their place. The Bible is not a misogynistic book. But when we do not do things God's way, this, in fact, can be the result. And so Peter says to women who have husbands who are disobedient to the word, they don't want the word. So win them without a word by your holy and reverent behavior. What does that behavior look like? Well, let's look at number two here, a picture. This is the principle, wives be submissive to your husbands. Let's look at the picture. The picture is in verses three and four. And I don't know about you, but it helps me at times to have a visual aid. So he says in verses three and four, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the eyes of God. So here Peter speaks to women, wives specifically, about their adornment. He talks to them about shopping, clothes, things that you wear. So our ears are going to perk up here for a moment. And he says there are two ways that a woman may adorn herself. The first is external, and he lists it. There are matters like braiding of hair, wearing of gold jewelry, and putting on of dresses. Now, Peter does not say that a woman ought not to adorn herself in this way. Let me be very clear. He is not here forbidding good hair. He's not forbidding dresses. He's not forbidding jewelry. There are some denominations, even in Jones County, that would tell you that it is an evil, biblically, to wear jewelry, to wear makeup, to wear pants. And listen. If a person has a personal conviction out of a matter of conscience, I'm not going to judge that, right? But when you try to impose a personal conviction on someone else, we have a problem. And what Peter is doing here is he is not saying that these things are by themselves evil. And he is also not speaking against lavish dress. Because whereas gold jewelry might be perceived as lavish, there's nothing lavish about dress, it's just something you wear and braiding one's hair, common in any society. No, what Peter is doing, he's not forbidding elegance, but he is forbidding a focus on externals. In other words, he's saying, ladies, you are not defined by your hair. You are not defined by what you wear. You are not defined by how pretty your face is. You are not defined by the things that you have. 
The externals, the things that a woman might use to feel good about herself and to be attractive to men are not the things that define the individual. Don't make your focus on externals. Instead, here's what your adornment should be. Internals. He says, focus rather on the hidden person of the heart. I love this word hidden. In the Greek language, it's the word crypto. And you might hear a parallel there, cryptic, right? Or crypt. What are we talking about? Something hidden. Something that lies beneath the surface. It's real. But you can't see it. And so what Peter says is instead of covering yourself with external things and adorning yourself to look beautiful by physical standards, what I want you to do, ladies, who are believers, I want you to bring that hidden person of the heart to the surface because it is in you. You believe in Jesus Christ, and you know that. But I want your husband to see that. I want you to adorn yourself with Christ, who took the posture of a servant, who gave his life, who submitted himself to the Father and to us so that he might show us the full extent of his love. Do you see what Peter is doing? He is calling women to obey and follow the example of Jesus Christ. But something else here is true. I believe that Peter is not only speaking to women, but the way he speaks is applicable to all believers. Look at it again. He says, let your adornment be the hidden person of the heart. Now that word person is the word anthropos in the original language, which refers to humanity in general. If you're a human, you are a person, the hidden person. It's not just the hidden woman, the inner man, the inner person, which all of us, if we obey Jesus Christ, if we believe in him, have Christ in us. And so the idea is to bring him to the surface so that he can be seen, so the change can be felt. And so our husband's, We'll see what it looks like to obey and follow him. Just as the submission of slaves to masters is a paradigm for Christian behavior in a fallen world, so too is the submission of believing wives to unbelieving husbands. Let's impress our husbands, not with the way we look on the outside, but with the hidden person of the heart that we bring to the surface. And let me issue one more clarification here. Verse 4. He talks about the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. Let me be clear. Gentleness and quietness are not, in and of themselves, feminine traits. To be feminine does not mean to be gentle and quiet. Many of us have women we greatly respect, love, and they love us. And they are anything but (laughs) gentle and quiet as we might define it. But the gentleness and quietness that he talks about here is the kind of gentleness and quietness that a very strong Savior showed by serving and loving and giving. These qualities, Peter says, are precious in the eyes of God. Number three, we've seen here a principle. We've seen the picture. Don't adorn yourself with externals. Don't worry about that. That's not your identity, how you look. You're defined by the hidden person of the heart. Number three, let's look at the pattern. The pattern, if there's one thing I know, it's that we're looking for patterns to follow. That's why we flip through Instagram so much. It's why we look through Facebook. We're looking for, oh, I could do my hair that way. Oh, I could wear this particular article of clothing. Oh, I like that jewelry. Oh, I like the way they did it. I might give that a try. Now, I don't think this, by the way. When I'm checking Instagram, I'm looking at different stuff. But some of us may look at that, and we're looking for patterns, okay? But here's the problem, ladies. If you're looking for patterns based on worldly standards, you're forever going to be living in envy and comparison. You're going to feel less than because there's someone that looks better than you, has more than you, can adorn themselves better than you. But if you have Jesus Christ in your heart, no one could ever have it better because you're his daughter. So here Peter points these ladies to a good pattern, a good example to follow. Verse 5, he says, In this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. Now, when he talks about in this way, he's speaking about internal adornment, not external adornment. And when he says in former times, what he's talking about is Old Testament history. 
He's talking about what happened under the old covenant. And when he speaks about the holy women who hoped in God, he is talking about the matriarchs of Israel. We're talking about the wives of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And here's what he says about these women. He says they are holy women who hoped in God. Now, we've already seen that Peter uses the word holiness to describe our condition in the eyes of God. We are a holy people because he has chosen us. And he also, in chapter 1, talks about our salvation in light of hope, that we have the hope that one day our salvation will be revealed when Jesus comes. What he's saying is that these women who lived thousands of years before the coming of Christ, nonetheless, placed their hope and need for holiness in the coming Christ. They were Christians, no less than the women to whom he writes, because Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient for us, future, present, past. We're saved by looking back to the death of Christ. They were saved by looking forward to the death of Christ. And here's how they did it. Verse 5. In this way, in former times, the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their husbands. How did they show faith in the Christ who was to come? Peter says... It was by being submissive to their husbands. And you might say, ladies, well, that was easy enough for them. I mean, their husband was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, patriarchs. I mean, these are the founders of the people of God. They were what we would consider Christians, churchgoers, good husbands, good fathers, respectable, surely. I mean, that's a bad comparison. Peter's talking to women who have husbands who are non-believers, and here he uses as an example these women who had believers who are husbands who were believers. But let's think for a moment about Abraham. There's a lot of things that were good about Abraham, but can we agree for a moment that Abraham's faith was hardly perfect? We're talking about the same Abraham that when he traveled to Egypt was afraid of being killed because people might see how beautiful his wife is and kill him so they could have her. So he lied and said, well, she's just my sister. And when the Pharaoh took her into his household to make her a concubine, only at that moment did God intervene and say to Pharaoh, you better not touch her because she's married to a righteous man. A righteous man? How does a righteous man do that to his woman exactly? And let's think about Jacob for a moment. You know what Jacob means? The word Jacob, the name? Deceiver. And that's what we find in Jacob's life. A life lift deceiving, stealing Esau's blessing, stealing Esau's birthright, manipulating, conniving. Listen, these men may have been believers, but they struggled greatly. And at times, ladies, it might be easier to submit to a man who's not a believer because, hey, he doesn't know God. How can I expect more than it is to submit to a man who does believe in God because he does no better. I think the pattern applies. As we look back to Sarah, as we look back to Rebecca and Rachel and Leah, they submitted to their husbands, proving themselves to be holy, proving themselves to be women of hope, putting their hope not in a present vindication of I'm going to tell him off, but putting their hope in a future vindication that God sees all and he will reward me. So many examples you can look to, so many magazines you can read, so many people you can turn to for advice. My advice is that you look at the holy women of God. Model yourselves after them, because if you do, then you are her children. When you do what is right, without any fear. Don't be afraid of what might happen to you. Don't be afraid of what your husband might say. Put your hope in God, and you can live without fear. But as I close this message, I want to close with a privilege. We've talked here about the principle, the picture, the pattern. Now let's talk about the privilege of what we have, what ladies you have to look forward to as God redeems and restores and brings your husband closer to him. Peter takes some time, and he does speak to men. And so I want to speak to the men in the room today. It is, after all, Father's Day. But let me speak to the men. Because there is no greater gift you can give your sons and daughters than showing them how to rightly live with a woman. They need to see it. Your daughters need to see it. If not, 
then she's going to accept any old Joe that comes along. He's going to mistreat her. Well, that's just the way men treat women. And your sons sure enough need to see it because they do not need to be violating young women who they have not made a commitment to, right? No ring, nothing for me, right? I mean, this is what we believe. This is the way we should operate. And men, it's going to come from you. They need to see this example. Verse 7, you husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. So first, let's notice that Peter has shifted focus. He's not speaking to women who are married to unbelieving husbands, but he is speaking to women who have believing husbands. And specifically, he's speaking to the believing husbands. For whereas unbelieving husbands had no knowledge of God, these men do. He says to them, live with your wives in an understanding way. In other words, live to her according to knowledge. That is the literal phrase. Live with her in accordance with the knowledge that you have been given in Jesus Christ. This is not an injunction to know your wife, to understand the way she is, her peculiarities. That is certainly good advice and something, men, we should do. But this is a more general statement, that you should live with her in accordance with the knowledge revealed to you by God. The revealed knowledge about the unique roles that God has assigned to men and that God has assigned to women. And that these roles, when properly exercised, hear me, mirror the relationship of Jesus Christ and his church. Can I remind you of the fact that this is the case? Ephesians chapter 5, I am almost done. Hang in just a few more minutes. Ephesians 5. After talking about husbands and wives and their relationship, Peter says in verse 32, This mystery is great, namely that husbands and wives become one flesh. But he says, I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Here's what you got to understand. Whenever the Bible speaks to husbands and wives, it is really talking about Christ and the church. Husbands and wives live this way because this is how the church relates to Christ and the way Christ relates to his church. Men, you'd better understand this. You had better understand this. You are the head of a man. But by golly, Christ is your head. And you will answer to your head for the way that you act as a head. What does the Bible say? It would be better for someone that a millstone be hung around his neck and cast in the sea than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. By little ones, we're talking about children. But I think there's a principle here. When God gives you opportunity, you had better leverage it for good. Live with her in an understanding way, according to knowledge of God's will and God's plan. And understand this, you are living with someone weaker. This is the toughest part of this passage. As we read this, it automatically sounds like an insult. But I want you to notice here what this word means. First of all, I believe it has physical dimensions. And let's be honest for a moment. Physically, the way God has designed men, the way testosterone is released in their body, the way God has designed women, and the way estrogen is released in their body. Women, as a rule, there are exceptions. There's some women who could kick my butt, right? But as a rule, men are stronger than women and therefore more vulnerable to abuse. Men, understand this. And don't leverage your strength to get your way. Live with her as a person physically weaker. Number two. Live with her as one who is socially weaker. It is less true today than it was then. But in this particular day, a woman's place in society was defined by her connection to a man. We live in a day where that is not as much the case. But even still, there is a battle for equal rights before the law. But socially, there was a weakness that women had a vulnerability. And the husband should recognize that and not perpetuate it, but treat her as one of equal worth and dignity. But number three, understand that one occupied a place of headship, right? And as such, she is vulnerable because as God is the head of Christ and Christ is the head of me, I'm her head. She has to live in some sense under me. I need to do that in an understanding 
way. And here's how I do it. By granting her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. In other words, not saying, remember your place, but lifting her. Listen, when Jesus saved us, he didn't put us down. He lifted us up. What did he do? He seated us with him in the heavenly places at his right hand. Here's what Peter desired for believing husbands and wives. That through their relationship, they would give a picture of what Christ had done for the church and what the church did in relationship to Christ. So they could give marriages to the world that would model Jesus. But it begins with the initiative of the husband. Guys, it's in your court. It is your call. Because her command before the Lord is to submit to you no matter how sorry you are. Let me tell you something. Just because God gives that does not mean that you have the right to be sorry and to fall short of your calling. Give thanks to God for the woman that he has given you. Give him your heart and your life so you can serve her the way Christ served the church. On Father's Day, I think there's no greater gift that we can give. There's no greater example that we can give. There's nothing that we can do more for our families, men, than to be the men that God has called us to be. And for you ladies that are here today, and you are living faithfully, submissively in a difficult situation, I encourage you, keep pressing on. You can do it because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Let's believe these things. Let's live these things. God will reward. Let's pray.